Okay, and we are live. Hi, Hello. everybody. Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's show. My name is Steve Slonsky, and I'll be our host for tonight's event. As I see it, my job is pretty simple. Say a few words, introduce our fabulous presenter, and then get out of the way. Uh, I work at an organization, Partners for Youth with Disabilities. We're a nonprofit based in the Boston area whose mission is to create a world where young people with disabilities can lead self-determined lives filled with dignity, pride, and purpose. We run a variety of youth programs focused on mentoring, career readiness, theater arts, and leadership development. In addition to that, we also train and consult with other organizations to help them become more inclusive of people with disabilities in the work that they do. Now, the show tonight is something a little different for us. Tonight was originally supposed to be the night of our party for PYD, our big annual gala and fundraiser, but Rona had different plans. Um, so we've rescheduled our party for PYD. We've moved it all online, June 17th. Save the date, everyone. But we're sad we won't be able to spend this evening celebrating with our community and connecting with all of our wonderful partners and friends. So instead, we made a new plan. We want to do something fun tonight, both for our community and the broader disability community. So many of our community members right now are feeling scared, isolated, and alone. And we figured we can't change everything that's happening in the world right now, but we can give us all a reason to smile. We can provide a reminder that our community is strong, vibrant, and here for one another. Now here at PYD, we're the host agency of the National Disability Mentoring Coalition. The NDMC is a collaboration of organizations from across the U.S. that aims to raise the awareness about the importance and impact of mentoring in the lives of people with disability, disabilities. And every year, the NDMC inducts leaders in the disability community into what we call the Disability Mentoring, the Susan M. Daniels Disability Mentoring Hall of Fame. Our fabulous presenter tonight was inducted into our Hall of Fame this year. Now, before I officially hand the reins over, I'd be remiss if I didn't also thank our sponsors for tonight's show. A huge thanks to Mitsubishi Electric America Foundation for providing the funding to cover the costs of tonight's show, allowing us to offer it for free for all participants to be able to offer all the accessibility features and, and um, accommodations we would wanted to provide. And an additional thanks to PolicyWorks and Cornell University's Yang Tan Institute for Employment and Disability for their ongoing support to the National Disability Mentoring Coalition. And now, drum roll, the moment we've all been waiting for. Our presenter tonight is an actress, comedian, writer, and disability advocate. She is a graduate of and a guest comedian in residence at Arizona State University. She is the co-founder and co-executive producer of the New York Arab American Comedy Festival and the Muslim Funny Fest. She was a full-time honor contributor to Countdown with Heath, Heath Olbermann, a columnist for the Daily Beast. She's appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Network on 60 Minutes on ABC News. Uh, and on top of all that, she had the most viewed TED Talk of 2014. I got 99 problems, but palsy is just one. And most importantly, frankly, in my mind, is near and dear to my heart, she's a Jersey resident, Jersey Pride. Um, so please welcome everyone, Mehsoon Zayed. Hi, everybody. So my name is Maysoon Zayed, and I have been in lockdown since March 14th, and I have had to take my live shows that are usually on stage and bring them online. And what I've figured out or found out is that it's a lot much more fun when I can interact with my audience. So tonight, instead of just doing my regular stand-up routine or giving you a pep talk to get you through this pandemic, I am going to do something that I call comedy freestyle. What that means is you are going to dictate the comedy and the jokes and the stories that I tell. And how we're going to do this is that from the very top of the show, you all can AMA, ask me anything. And then I will pick questions to answer. And they won't really be answers as much as I'll tell whatever story I want to tell that that question triggers. If I don't have an answer, I will simply say the answer is C and I will move on. That rarely happens, but every once in a while it does. And when you have no answers in life, the answer is always C. Now, there are several different ways that you can ask questions. One, the bottom of your screen, there is a chat box. You can click on the chat box, 
click panelists and all attendees and type in your questions. I see people typing away in the chat box. Terry Hartman Squire has po posted like 14 different links. She's like my number one flavor flav hype man, best in the world. Two, if you would rather ask an ASL, we have Emily here. She can translate for me. So if you would rather use your video camera, I believe that there's a way for you to do that. I'm not sure, but I'll throw it to Steve. But we want to make sure that everyone has a chance to ask a question. Now, your questions can be deep or they can be super shallow. It could be anything from what's your favorite movie to if you were president of the United States right now, what would you do? Anything you want to ask, anything I'm ready to joke about. Um, please keep in mind that Steve said, not me, Steve said, not me, that this is a family event. So like, let's try to keep it a little bit family friendly. But obviously, you know, if you want to ask me about love and romance, dating advice, anything, it's open season. So to get ready, I just want to tell those of you who don't know me a little bit about, um, about myself so that it can motivate some of your questions, okay? My name is Mason Zayed, and for those of you who don't know me, in the Prussian Olympics, I would win a gold medal. I am Palestinian, I'm Muslim, I'm a woman of color, I'm disabled, and I live in New Jersey. If you don't feel better about yourself, maybe you should. Now, are we ready? Let's go to the questions. I'm gonna click. Oops, I clicked the wrong button, which is great. My Zoom is now gone. Okay. Let's see. Favorite palsy joke. <laughs> I'm gonna leave that to the very end and hope that the kids are asleep. Cause my, well, oh, one second guys. I'm gonna quit my mail so that it doesn't keep binging that way, which is annoying, sorry. Okay, sorry, that banging, okay. Who is cutting my hair? Nobody is cutting my hair because I don't cut my hair. If you guys have noticed, it just grows wild as long as I want. My problem, unlike other people in quarantine, is not hair cutting. My problem is this, every two weeks, I get dipped in a vat of wax, hot, bubbling wax from my nose all the way in my toes and they just rip. So while most people are worried about their haircuts, my issue is that I officially have become a hobbit. I mean, if you could see me close up, you would see I currently look like the love child of Frida Kahlo and Bert from Sesame Street. <laughs> How do you go about dating with a disability? I'm gonna answer this seriously, and then I'll tag a joke on the end. <clears throat> right now we're living in a virtual world, right? And people with disabilities are always tempted to not mention their disability from the beginning because they don't want that to be what the relationship's about. They want the person to love them for who they are, not be concerned about their disability. No wrong buzz boo, no, don't do it. You have to tell people you're disabled right off the bat. If the person that you're interested in cannot handle dating a person with a disability, it's game over. You're not gonna change them. It's just gonna be a struggle to the end and it's better to weed out the duds from the beginning. So be upfront with who you are and the fact that you're disabled, but don't be a drag. I know it's hard. I know a lot of us are very passionate and that we like to talk nonstop about injustice lead with your disability, but I'm not saying be like, I'm a positive super crip, but what I'm saying is once you get that out of the way, talk about all those other things that you would have talked about had you not led with your disability. Talk about all those things that you want people to know who you are. So it's like when I first started doing stand-up comedy, my comedy teacher the very first time I ever went on stage, I did a joke about the Virgin Mary and Jesus. I thought I was really edgy. It was funny, whatever. And my comedy teacher was like, what's going on because of the cerebral palsy? And I was like, you know, I don't really want to joke about my cerebral palsy. I just want to talk. And he said, listen, people watching you will either think you're nervous or you're drunk. If you don't address it, they will be distracted the whole time. It's the same approach to, to dating. 
address it, talk about it, answer the uncomfortable questions, and then move on. And if you find yourself having to constantly explain your disability over and over, you're with someone who doesn't care enough to learn and you need to move on. So give them a chance to learn, give them a chance to adjust. But if five years in, they still don't get that you can't pour hot tea, get rid of them. Okay, next question. What will you miss most once this pandemic quarantine is over? So in the before time, I used to fly 200 to 280 days a year. And what I will miss the most is not flying while I'm disabled. Flying while you're disabled is like a whole thing. I mean, most airlines literally prioritize people's luggage over our actual bodies. I took a flight to um, Maine and I have cerebral palsy. I am mobile, but I'm an optional wheelchair user. And when I fly, I have to take muscle relaxants because my legs tense up too much. Now, for anyone who's from the older generation, there used to be a movie called 16 Candles where the sister takes muscle relaxants and she's like, <laughs> that's exactly how I am. So I use a wheelchair when I fly because I have jelly legs. So I get to Maine, the flight lands, they open the plane, it's an outdoor landing, and there is a metal staircase with a wheelchair at the bottom. What did they think I was gonna do? Become a Pegasus unicorn and float down to my chair? Was I supposed to roll down the stairs and magically like Simone Biles land on my butt in the chair? So what I won't, what I will miss the most about the pandemic is not having to fly. Oh, I love this question. This question is, What's a controversial, unpopular opinion you have? All right, Steve, I'll do a disclaimer before it. Anything that is shared right now is the property of the comic. Please do not punish the organization that has invited me to entertain you. I believe in equality for all, regardless of race, gender, orientation, economic class, ability, height, weight, age. This is very, very controversial because I'm also Palestinian. And I believe that Palestinians deserve equal rights regardless of faith. Oh no. So bad. I've literally been disinvited from giving talks when people find out that I think Palestinians deserve equality. I've been excluded from hosting and participating in some of the most famous talk shows on television because people assumed that I was anti-Semitic because I believed in equality for all. And what I really believe is I'm Palestinian and I believe the solution to the Palestine-Israel predicament is equal rights for all regardless of faith. I don't think that you can separate these Semites. I think that they already live together in a situation that's kind of similar to COVID America. Palestinians are cleaning their houses, they're working in their supermarkets, they're building their homes, they are driving on the same roads, but we're not allowed to have equal rights because we're too dangerous. We can make you the best shakshuka you ever ate, but God forbid we have equal rights, we'll just kill them all. So I think my most controversial opinion is that I believe Palestinians deserve equal rights, that Palestine and Israel should be one state, a beacon for all faiths and no faiths with equality and justice for all. <coughs> Sorry, nobody panic about the cough. Prior to this show starting, a bug literally flew down my throat and I tried to make it not happen and it did and I'm still kind of probably having something buzzing in my throat which sounded dirty but it's not okay does your disability make you feel lonely or feel like people are intentionally ignoring you no but you have to understand where I've gotten so first of all I was born very very privileged and sometimes people think that if you're disabled 
you can't also be privileged. Well, you can. I have walking privilege. I have verbal privilege, the fact that I, you know, I, I can speak. I have lost Kardashian, long, luxurious brown hair privilege. I have a lot, lot of privilege. So I was raised by a family that always included me and never treated me like a burden. That is not the reality for the majority of disabled people I meet who are teens, who are adults. So many people were not uplifted and empowered by their family. So I could see how it gets lonely. Um, I hope that people who feel lonely will reach out online and find the incredible disabled Ohana that lives online. Yes, there are people who are dangerous. There are people who you shouldn't hang out with. But there are some ballers, some revolutionaries like Alice Wong and Emily Ledeau. And maybe I could like write a list of like dope disabled adults to hang out with and look up to so that you feel less lonely. We exist. We've been silenced for too long. A lot of us have found our voices online. And I think that when you feel lonely, I very much encourage you reaching out to find the rest of the people who are lonely too and realize that you may be physically alone, but virtually a lot of us are going through the same thing. Who are my comedic role models? Okay, I'm gonna first tell you a bunch of men. So, hey Steve, I just wanna let you know a technical thing. You're the pinned video, so your frozen face that's not moving at all is what is the main screen for most people. I should be the pinned video, just letting you know. Okay, <laughs> right now we just have a white man representing me on screen and I'm uncomfortable. Okay, um, my comedic influences, George Carlin, Robin Williams, Gilda Radner, Dave Chappelle, Whoopi Goldberg, big time, and ultimately Richard Pryor. So my dream in life growing up was to be on the daytime soap opera General Hospital. And my parents really encouraged me to chase my dreams. So I went and I, you know, I went to acting school in Arizona State University. I came back, I started auditioning, and I wasn't getting cast in anything. And I started looking on the TV and I didn't see people who looked like me. But where I did see myself was the world of stand-up comedy, especially with Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor was the original brown shaking comic. He even did, you know, stand-up comedy in a wheelchair and he was talking about being bisexual and he was cutting edge on every level. And even though television shunned disability and the actors who played disabled on TV were all, always miraculously um, healed, on the red carpet, I found my voice in stand-up comedy and that's how I, I started doing it. Somebody asked me who I play on General Hospital. So I'm a recurring character on General Hospital and the powers that be have been so amazing because as I mentioned, I tour between 200 and 280 days a year. So General Hospital is shot in Los Angeles and I'm in Austria, Mumbai, New York, this is all in the before time. Now I'm just in my apartment in Cliffside Park, New Jersey. And by the way, my hometown and my disability have the same initials, CP. These letters are haunting me. Um, but I pay, play Zara Amir on General Hospital. She is a high powered lawyer with a shady past that has not been written yet, which means nobody actually knows where her past is. But I'm a great lawyer. I win all of my cases. And it's fun because my clients are like hardened criminals who have like bitten babies' heads off on screen. And so I love getting them off on television. It's, it's wonderful. But what's really neat about Zara is the fact that she's not written as disabled. I started appearing on General Hospital on May 17th of 2019. It took me 20 years to achieve my dream, but I did. And we've never mentioned her disability. And that is not because we are ashamed. It's not because we want to pass. It's because it's irrelevant to the conversations she's having. So like if I'm in a courtroom scene with Diane and Alexis Davis, for example, I wouldn't be like, 
hey, I have cerebral palsy. That's not how life works. And I think it's been really exciting to be on a soap opera and able to just be, like be a really good lawyer who happens to shake, having accommodations in the courtroom. So when they say all rise, my character doesn't. And she's not reprimanded because the judge clearly knows that she has a disability because she's asked for accommodations. So we've never had to address it on screen. And I hope that as the character evolves and as the years roll by, that we will have a storyline where she has like a sordid, torrid love triangle. Because I'm really excited to show that people with disabilities are not happy snowflake angel babies that never grow up, never get married, and never do the wild thing. I want to show that we are exactly like our non-disabled um, counterparts. We make bad decisions in love and sometimes good ones, and we can be parents, and we can have heartbreak, and we can be vixens, and we can be villains, and the whole gamut of it. So it's been a real blessing. I'm very, very grateful to Frank Valentini, the executive producer, for giving me the shot. Okay, somebody's asking me, how did I break into becoming a writer? I'm sorry, guys, that this isn't super duper comedic. It seems like this is turning into an episode of Advice You Don't Want to Hear, but I feel like it's what we need. So let's just like roll with my homies, you know. Um, how I became a writer is because I became a comic. You can't be a comedian without being a writer. Nobody writes you jokes. You got to wake up every morning, sit down, and write jokes. And every night when you get on stage, you try those jokes, and you come off stage, and you revamp those jokes. And every comic who's worth it, like, I freestyle. I don't memorize. But I still write every day. I'm like, what's caught my attention? How can I make this joke funnier? My advice to aspiring writers is write without editing. There's a book called The Artist's Way, and The Artist's Way challenges artists to write for one hour a day. Take that one hour a day and tweak it to whatever your abilities are. So if you can only write five minutes a day, write five minutes a day. If you can write three hours a day and your lifestyle allows for that type of time, write three hours a day. But you must force yourself to write and you cannot say, I have writer's block because there's no such thing. If you can't think of anything to write, you write down, I can't think of anything to write. I can't think of anything to write. I can't think of anything to write. Hey, what was that show that I watched last night? That was pretty funny. You know, I love that character, David. Let me go off. And that I can't think of anything to write will eventually open up the door for you to write something. But if you edit as you go, you'll never finish. We are our worst critics. So get down your idea first with no judgment and then go back and start editing. Make it funnier, make it more dramatic, make it shorter. But don't give yourself any rules the first time that you write. And understand writing doesn't make money. So have something else you love that can generate income. Um, I love this question, what, what is your favorite music artist? My favorite music artist of all times is Dave Matthews. And I'd like to now tell my Dave Matthews band story. So I love, love, love Dave Matthews. The first time I ever heard Dave Matthews, it was like, I'm very, very old. And we used to have these things called tapes. They were plastic and they had like a line of like plastic inside the plastic and this plastic played music. And we used to pass around tapes of these underground bands. And the band would be like in Virginia and it would go from like a college student in Virginia to one in Ohio to one, yeah, to one in Arizona. And I was in Arizona in 1993 and I got a Dave Matthews band tape and I instantly fell in love. Like three years later, he does a song called Crash. It becomes a huge hit. He starts to play these big arenas and I am like going to every show. And I go to 103 Dave Matthews band shows before the first time I ever met him. 
And the first time I ever met him, I was doing a movie with Adam Sandler. And I walk into the movie and it's like comedy heaven. It's Adam Sandler, Chris Rock, um, Kevin James, Dana Carvey, Kevin Nealon. And I'm carrying a Dave Matthews band laptop bag because I'm trying to look cool. And Adam Sandler, who is the kindest, funniest, most humble dude ever, super disabled friendly, all about accommodations, has disabled people like working in admin on the crew in this on screen. He's really great and very unsung. He sees my bag and he's like, do you like Dave Matthews? And I'm like, no, I don't like Dave Matthews. I love, 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 love Dave Matthews. And so he goes, okay, well, he's in this movie. And I'm like, ha funny man being funny. I totally think he's kidding, right? And I go to hair and makeup and the movie is about a hairdresser. So our hair and makeup is perfect. I walk on set like I'm ready for my close up, Mr. Sandler, and I see Dave Matthews. And so Adam's like, hey, I'm gonna give you a private introduction because I know that you're such a big fan. And Dave finishes doing his shot, he comes off, and Adam's like, hey Dave, this is May Soon, she's a really big fan. I stick out my hand to shake his hand because this is the before time we could shake hands. I stick out my hand and all of a sudden I start crying like someone shot my cat. And I'm like, I don't know, wait, I'm here and I'm in the refugee camp. And I'm like, hush into me. And I'm like singing lyrics. Now, this is a hundred million dollar movie. If you delay shooting by even five minutes, you're costing them like $25,000. And so the makeup artist comes running up to me. Her name is Kathleen, she's dope. Comes running up to me to try and fix my makeup because I'm crying my face off. Dave thinks it's a photo op. So he puts his arm around my waist and I pass out cold. I come to and like I'm Sandler's giant watermelon head is in my face and they put me in timeout. And I drive home that night and I'm devastated because I finally met my most favorite singer ever and I carried a watermelon. I blew it. So the next day I go back to set and I thought Dave was just there one day for a guest shot. Well, his tour bus is parked on set and I walk on set and I'm like, great, now I'm going to be in timeout for the whole rest of the day. And instead, as I walked across the campus, Dave Matthews sang my name and we became friends and now to this day whenever he has a concert and our tours overlap i sit backstage by the guitars and dave matthews band is my favorite band and my favorite song by them is gray street can you talk a little bit about your experience being middle eastern in the comedy business so this has three different levels I became a comedian in 2000. At my third show, I met a Palestinian comedian named Dean Obidala. We were doing these shows in New York City, which were called Barker shows, bark like a dog. And comedians would stand on the corner in Times Square and give out flyers. And it was called barking. And your goal was to get seven people in and if you got seven people in, they would let you do stand-up comedy. Now, I'm disabled, and my cerebral palsy, because cerebral palsy is different in everyone. Some of us are wheelchair users, you know. In my case, I shake all the time, but also I can't stand. So I can dance, I can run, I can walk, but I can't stand, I fall right over. So since I couldn't stand, they didn't make me bark. I got to just sit inside. And so I'm sitting inside and this guy walks in and as soon as I see him, I know he's Arab because he has the Arab eyebrows. He looks Italian like Dean Martin, but he's got these crazy Arab eyebrows. And that was my friend Dean Obidala. One year after I started stand-up comedy, 9-11 happened. And after 9-11 happened, people were vilifying Arabs and Muslims in the media. Muslims who were on green cards or visiting America were forced to register. It was a really, really dark time in our history. 
So Dean Obidala and I joined forces and we decided to start something called the New York Arab American Comedy Festival, ArabComedy.com. That's now its 16th year. And what we wanted to do was combat the negative images of Arabs and Muslims in media by redefining who we were, the godfathers of comedy. Some of the most famous actors in American comedy history are Arabs. Danny Thomas, Make Room for Daddy, Vic Tabak, Mel's Diner, Jamie Farr on MASH, Kathy Najimy, Veronica's Closet, and now Rami Youssef on Hulu. It's our history. And what had happened post 9-11 was we were relegated to terrorists and taxi drivers. And if we were women, we were either belly dancers or hidden behind burqas. And what we wanted to do was redefine ourselves as who we actually identified as. Americans who happened to be Arab, Americans who had to happen to be Muslim, Arabs who were also Christian, people were proud of their heritage. On that journey, I was also spending every summer in Palestine. Since the day when I was born, my parents always sent me to live in Palestine in the summers. I used to live with my grandparents when I was a kid. And as an adult, I started going back and working with disabled and wounded refugee children to help them be mainstreamed in the public school system. And people ask me like, how do you make money and what kind of job do you have that you can just fly to Palestine and hang out for you know, two or three weeks? And I was like, I'm a comedian. And they were like, well, what's a comedian? I was like, I tell jokes. They're like, people pay you to tell jokes? I'm like, yeah, it's a pretty dope job. Not right now in the pandemic, but in general. And uh, and so I did a comedy show in Palestine. Uh, my first was in Jerusalem, uh, excuse me. My first was in Bethlehem. My second was in Ramallah. My third was in Jerusalem. My fourth was in Nazareth. And the first show I did, people couldn't believe I was making fun of myself because they had seen characters, they had seen parody, but they'd never seen people talking about themselves, being self-deprecating, telling these really personal stories about love or their parents or their cat. And so they say, but I do not believe that I am the first person to perform stand-up comedy in Jordan or Palestine. And the reason I say I don't believe that is because what if there was like a great comedian in 1950 and there was just no internet and people didn't know that she was fabulous, but she was doing comedy for years and years before I was ever discovered. But what I got to do, which was really special, is I was the first image of stand-up comedy they ever saw. So the fact that I was a woman wasn't a negative. In America, the energy in the room literally drops when a female comedian gets on stage. But in the Middle East, they had never seen comedy. So they didn't think it was weird to have a woman on stage. And so then when the men finally flew out and started doing comedy, people were like, <laughs> a bunch of guys trying to be funny. Imagine guys aren't funny. This is a chicks game. So it was really fun to uh, define that. Okay, guys, uh, gals and non-binary and everybody, I'm going to scroll up because there's questions and I, I miss people. What's a surprising positive part of having CP? I burn a lot of calories because I shake all the time. I'm just constantly burning calories. Like my life is like one soul cycle class. Also, I don't know if this is real or not, but people with CP look young. Guess in the chat how old I am. CP, it keeps your skin young. It don't crack, CP don't crack. It's, it's, a, it's a benefit. Okay. Oh, thank you for the person who said they love me on Judy Gold's podcast. How far or edgy do you feel comfortable going with in diversity rooted comedy? Is there a too far? No, all is fair in comedy, all is fair in comedy. And now I'm gonna have a really weird conversation with you all. I 
joke about dead babies. I joke about pandemics. I do joke about civil wars. I joke about the day of mourning for people with disabilities whose parents have killed them. And the reason I joke about these things is that I believe that if you tell people something they don't want to hear in a comedic way, they're much more likely to listen to you. And when I was in the situation where I was trying to create positive images of the Arabs and Muslims, I used to say, if someone's laughing, they probably won't kill you. They might still do it, but they're less likely to. And so I don't believe anything is off limits, but I also approach my comedy the way a good doctor, a, and not a fake good doctor played by a non-disabled actor, but a good doctor approaches their work. First, do no harm. When I started my career in 2000, I used every slur in the book because I was watching Andrew Dice Clay and Eddie Murphy and I wanted to be like them. So I said, you know, the F word and the K word and like any slur I could come up with, I fat shamed, I slut shamed. I never used the N word because at least I was woke enough at that point to know better. But I use slurs a lot. I did jokes about pedophilia. I was edgy and nothing was off limits and nobody was gonna censor me. And then one day I was at a show and a woman came up to me and she said, you know that joke you did about pedophilia? I said, yeah. She said, you know, I was molested as a child and I just came here to have fun. And this is what you did. And I was like, you know, she's right. That wasn't my story to tell. If it had been my story to tell, I would have every right to. It wasn't my story to tell. And I had caused harm to a person who had come to laugh for no benefit. I don't mind making you uncomfortable if you're a racist and I'm telling jokes that make you realize that you're a bad person, be uncomfortable. But if you're coming to laugh and I remind you of a violent moment in your life and a of a mo moment that you were dehumanized, that's not what I wanna do as a comic. I wanna make people laugh. I wanna make people think. I don't want to cause harm. And I believe that I can be just as funny without using slurs, without fat shaming, without being ableist. And one of my favorite words in the entire universe is the word stupid. I'm from New Jersey, I love the word stupid. And it's ableist. And it's been so hard for me to stop using it, but I love the challenge. I love coming up with like, what's my word for the S word today? Is it cockamamie? Is it silly rabbit? Is it, you know, dip wad? Whatever I come up with, I love being challenged to pick a word that's funny, that's powerful, and that doesn't cause harm. That isn't a word that people were bullied with or abused with or dehumanized with. So when I censor myself, it's not because I'm fearing political ramifications or that I'm going to get killed or that. And by the way, I get death threats all the time. And I never stop fighting injustice and fighting for disability rights and fighting to end violence against women out of fear of those death threats. I have no problem getting death threats, but if you come up to me and say, did you know that was an Asian slur and that the joke that you made was extremely racist and I didn't? I'm not gonna say, no, I didn't know and it was funny and fuck you. Sorry, sorry. Um, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna learn and I'm gonna respect that if someone from a community I'm not from says something I did caused harm, I'm not gonna question their reality. I'm not gonna question their truth and say, well, I never heard that moon face was a slur, so I can use it because I meant no harm. I'm like, wow, thank you for taking the time to tell me. I will do better and I appreciate it. If you could meet anyone, who would it be and why? It's a tie. So some of you all got to see my cat when she was walking behind me. She got bored and went to sleep, but her name is Beyonce. And I would love, love, love to meet Queen Bee. I think she's a fantastic entertainer, an incredible philanthropist, 
a gorgeous dancer. My parents couldn't afford physical therapy, so they sent me a tap class. So I'm a devout, devout dancer. I would love to dance with Beyonce. And I'd love to meet Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton is an angel walking amongst us. She is light, she is pure, she is laughter, she is music, and I hope I get to be in her presence someday. What do you think it's going to take for disability history to be included in the elementary cu curriculum? I think we'd have to defeat Donald Trump because if we don't, there'll be no education in this country. Favorite ice cream? I can't eat sugar because it makes me shake all the time. So I like those weird, wacky, natural ones that are just kind of like ice and fruit, like, a, like mango sorbet or like a lavender ice cream. When I look crazy, no, crazy is ableist. When I look owl-eyed, it means I'm scrolling up. Who's your favorite at Real Housewife? Teresa, because she flipped the table. Full disclosure, I've never ever watched The Real Housewives. I don't like watching women fight. I write a lot of like screenplays and like sitcoms and sketches. And I always write women who are like friends and powerful and lift each other up instead of the frenemy stereotype. There's this great. Can we have a round of applause for the ASL translator, Emily? I talk so fast and have completely forgotten about her until the 45 minute mark where I just saw her like just signing with all her might. And I'm sorry I've been so fast and I forgot about you. <laughs> Who is the biggest influence in your life? My dad. Um, and if my mom hears that, she's gonna be mad at me. So I'll say, and my mom equally. No, my dad. Um, my dad was my hero. I was the youngest of four girls. My mother went back to college. So I hung out with my dad like nonstop. I was like his wing crip. I was like the only girl at the mosque, you know, prostrate between legacy of men. And um, he was my biggest influence because he would wake up before school and do exercise with me for two hours so that I could be the healthiest and in least pain and most functional as I could be. He didn't do it to push me or to heal me or to make me better. He did it to empower me, relax me and strengthen me. Um, he laughed all the time. He taught me how to joke. He taught me to hold my head high. He never made me feel ashamed. And he grew up in a culture when on the day I was born, one of my relatives said, leave her under a tree and let the monkeys raise her up. They didn't want the shame of having a disabled person in the family. And my father, who grew up in that type of culture, instead exalted me, lifted me up, helped school me, and got me to where I am today, which is a rock superstar. Now there's 28 messages on the bottom. Somebody should save this chat. It would be fun to answer everything. What's the most recent show that you've binged on? Cobra Kai. Cobra Kai is on YouTube Red. I'm not trying to get you guys to sign up for another service. I'm super sorry about this. But Cobra Kai is a series based on the Karate Kid. And it stars the guy who played Johnny Lawrence, William Zabka, and the guy who played Daniel's son, um, Ralph Macchio. And they have these amazing flashbacks with Mr. Miyagi. And the series is now happening 30 years later. It's funny, it's campy, it's suspenseful, and it has some of the best choreography in the game. Um, I also absolutely loved this BBC show called Back to Life. It's about a chick who went to jail when she was 18 and she comes out of jail and she just wants to live her life and like no one will let her. Um, I love that show. I loved Succession because I'm an old Sopranos fan. 
So Succession is a good show um, to binge. And then I binged like an old show and I guess it was the pandemic was making me need like a comfort food version of shows. So I watched all of Little House on the Prairie. It might not hold up. Oh, and I love Schitt's Creek. S-C-H-I-T-T-S, -T -T Eugene Levy, Dan Levy. It is amazing. Um, just an incredible show, the best comedy I've probably ever seen on television. And of course, number one, it's not bingeable because there's a new episode every day, but you should never miss an episode of General Hospital. Oh, and a super, super thank you to our live captioner. I'm not sure where the captions are because I can't see them on my screen because I'm um, paying attention to the chat. I actually can't see me either. And I'm probably like a bobblehead that never looks at the camera correctly. So I'm sorry for anyone that I'm disorienting, but you're being ableist if you're not cheering me on. <laughs> Someone said, okay, Dolly Parton and Schitt's Creek, you're totally my kind of friend. I am a good friend. And by the way, I give really, really, really good romantic advice. So if you need romantic advice, just like pop on my Twitter and ask me and I'll totally help you out. But I give you advice you don't want to hear. What experience do you have? I'm not sure what that's referring to. <laughs> I have a 20 year comedy career. I've been a stand up comic for 20 years. I had the most viewed TED talk of 2014. I'm on General Hospital. I do news commentary. I have like 900 jobs. I always tell artists, you can't be one thing. You have to be a jack of all trades. And if you are, something will eventually um, make you money. How tall am I? I'm a giant. I'm a big, big girl. I'm five foot seven. And I usually wear a three inch heel because my parents couldn't afford physical therapy. They sent me a tap class and I learned how to tap dance in heels. So I prefer to wear heels. What is your favorite subject in school? I loved history, loved history, which is probably bad because I think I was taught very white history. <laughs> I was like, yay, women got the vote. Oh, I didn't know black women didn't get the vote, um, but I loved history in school. Sharon says, my disability also makes me look young. Somebody asked, what is a comedy show? So this is not a comedy show. What a comedy show is, is when a comedian walks on stage and they tell jokes and the jokes can't be other people's jokes. So say someone told you a really funny joke about a bear and a rabbit in the woods. Stand-up comedy stand is not going up and telling that story again. Stand-up comedy is telling your own jokes, ones that you made up. So like in my case, I joke about my cat, I joke about dating and marriage, and I joke about being pulled over when I'm driving my car. And um, that's what a comedy show is. Which superhero would you most like to date? I have to really think about that one. I'm super embarrassed that I'm drawing a blank. So somebody type this name for me in the chat. I call this pandemic fog. I never ever draw a blank. Michael B. Jordan's character in Black Panther. Killmonger. I would date Killmonger. Zara and Mir from General Hospital would date Killmonger and we'd have beautiful evil children. Um, somebody asked me, what's my favorite thing to do in leisure time? I love dancing. So in the before time, I used to go to clubs all the time. It's super fun to be in a club with cerebral palsy because people just think you're drunk. 
So it's like you totally fit in instead of being the only person. They're like, dude, that girl is just like dancing all the time. She never stops. She's like so passionate. Even her eyebrows and lips and lungs are dancing. How many times have I been in love? Three. Three. But only one of them won. <laughs> Tell us about Yes, I Can Can. Do you want to know about Yes, I Can Can the show or Yes, I Can Can the mantra? I'm going to wait to see an answer on that one. Favorite TV show as a kid? I loved Little House on the Prairie and General Hospital. I also loved Inspector Gadget and Gem and the Holograms. Somebody asked me, okay, so there's two questions back to back. One is, have you seen the documentary Crip Camp? Yes, and please see the article I wrote about it on Refinery29. I think that movie is one of the most important documentations of American disability history ever, but it also just made me fall in love with our community more than ever. I'm so proud to be disabled and so proud to be part of this revolution. Um, somebody asked me what my thoughts, oh, thank you so much, Steve, for posting that. That, that was fast, that was awesome. Um, somebody asked me what my thoughts are on the Jersey Shore. Um, as long as you're not harming anyone, I'll always cheer you on, um, but that's not what the Jersey Shore is like. Oh no, we only have six minutes left. Oh my gosh, somebody asked me about me and math. I cannot do math. I'm bad at finance, I have no executive function, and I can't tell time. So I can look at the clock right now and see that it's 7.55. But did you see how I was all like, yo, there's only six minutes left. I had no idea that 50 minutes had passed. In my mind, it was like seven. So I'm kind of late for everything because I just look up and like right now it's dark and the light should be on in my house. And it didn't even occur to me that it's Ramadan, sun is going to set while you're on. You should probably have lights on. I'm basically sitting in the dark and you guys are tolerating it because Ruth Bader Ginsburg has my back. Yes, I'm wearing an RBG shirt. And it says, I'm going to move my hair. It says, never underestimate the power of a girl with a book. Never underestimate the power of a girl with a book. I'm uh, wearing it because I'm sending healing vibes to RBG and because um, I'm an author and a writer and I think books are really powerful. And I love that mantra and kind of wanted its power um, behind me today. My favorite video game. So I wasn't a big video game person because of the whole coordination thing before they had like accessible controls. I do love uh, Guitar Hero by Wii. I love the drums on Guitar Hero big time. And I love Miss Pac-Man. Joysticks are fun. Oh, Ramadan Mubarak, thank you. For those of you who don't know, this is the month of Ramadan. Muslims fast from sunrise to sunset if they can, can't. And if they can't, you can just donate food or you can donate service. You don't have to fast if it's going to kill you. We're about suffering a little, not about dying. Um, Derek Shields asked about my fairy god mentor, and I think that's a really good place to kind of wrap this all up. Um, my fairy god mentor is a woman named Laureen Arbus. And I met Laureen Arbus because I was doing a show called Countdown with Keith Oberman. And one of her assistants saw me and she had an award show called Women Who Care. It was a luncheon. And she decided to give me an award. And that's how I met her. And Laureen, who is the daughter of the people who founded ABC television, had a sister named Cookie with cerebral palsy. And her mother was a disability rights champion. She's a disability rights champion. She also fights against violence against women. 
and I met her and she became my fairy god mentor. And literally every success I have is because of doors she opened, not things she gave me. And this is the perfect question to end with. Um, before I answer this question, I'm going to shamelessly plug myself. I have a book on Audible called Find Another Dream. Even though it's an audiobook, I made sure that there was a downloadable PDF to go with the book. So if you can't listen, you can definitely read it. My website is maysoon.com. It has links to my Instagram, my Facebook, my Twitter, where I never, ever, ever, ever stop fighting the power. <laughs> you know, um, people say that it's uncomfortable to talk about politics. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about equality. I'm talking about right to life. I'm talking about survival. And I hope that you all will band together with me to make sure that during this quarantine, no one forgets that disabled lives matter, that we are not expendable, and no one, regardless of ability, is less important than the economy. And I'm going to end with my favorite quote. And my favorite quote is, I had to think about it, but I know it, but, Pandemic brain is getting me. Oh my God. Um, oh no. It's a Dave Matthews song. Oh yeah. Good love, fight for every day. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thank you for inviting me, Steve. I hope we can all meet on the other side. I'm sorry it got super dark and I forgot to turn on the lights and I'm probably really hard to see for people with visual impairments. Thank you for your patience. My name is Maysoon Zayed. And if I can can, you can can. Thank you so much, Maysoon, for that. That was fantastic and amazing. I know there are many of our youth participants that were here today. That I'm, I feel like this turned into a little bit of, of informal group mentoring as well. So thank you for sharing all of your perspective and experience and, and for a lot of the laughs in there too, honestly. So um, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, if you, I'll be sending out a recording afterwards to folks who, um, and, we'll, and we'll probably be posting it and stuff. So keep, keep, uh, uh, stay tuned for all that and hope everyone has a great rest of the evening. <laughs>